Welcome, everyone. Um, decided to get together and kind of do this uh, question and answer because I felt that it was just, uh, we're just getting inundated with, with phone calls and uh, looking for information. I thought the best way is not for me to sit here and just give a lecture. Um, it's to uh, try to assist by answering your questions um, and give somebody some guidance from, from what I know, okay? And strategies that I would probably be, that I am doing myself, basically. Um, so this is the first time that we're doing a, a, a virtual webinar. Uh, I think this is the wave of the future. Um, so we're just kind of learning a few things ourselves here. Um, I can't actually see anybody. Um, I know we got a bunch of participants coming on. Uh, oh, Christy Stratus. Hi there, Chris. Um, <laughs> So that tells you there's your chat box. Yeah, so what I need you guys to do is, um, you have some questions that came in already. Um, we'll kind of talk about that. Yeah, but you guys can, uh, what you need to do is, as you roll along here is, in the chat box, um, just post up some questions. And we'll just try to answer them as, as we go along. Um, I may need to even run in and out to get a couple of products to show you guys a few different things. Uh, can you guys hear me clearly? That's the first thing I need to know. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. All right, good, thank you. Um, so let's just, uh, I guess the easy place to kind of start is, um, you guys are inundated with information, I know. Uh, so I apologize if I'm gonna be uh, sharing a few things that are kind of remedial. Um, maybe they're not, but I think it's a, a good place to start at least, which is uh, people wanna say, like, what is a virus? What actually is it? <laughs> um, and how is it different from a bacteria, a bacterial infection? Um, well, the first thing is that a virus is extremely, extremely tiny, uh, uh, way smaller than a bacteria, way smaller than a bacteria. And I think the fundamental thing that's different is that a, um, a bacteria is self-replicating. I mean, it can, it can reproduce itself. A virus can't do that. A virus needs a host uh, in order to replicate itself. A bacteria does not. Um, as far as how, how big a or how large or how tiny, I should say, a, uh, a virus is, it's, if, you, if you took a grain of sand, you could probably line up about 100 to 1,000 viruses from end to end in that grain of sand. So that's pretty small, right? Um, people who ask me, um, can you see it under a microscope? And the answer is yes. Uh, with really, really strong microscopes, we have seen it. In fact, good God, back in the 1920s, it was uh, Dr. Royal Reif. Um, uh, some of you guys are familiar with the Reif machines that we use here. Um, he actually was the first one to observe viruses under a microscope. Um, and his theory back then was, uh, uh, can a virus have a certain vibrational frequency? Um, and if so, could we design something to match that vibrational frequency? Uh, so under these microscopes, they would actually, through a lot of testing, they would find these viruses, different viruses, and we were actually able to sequence out the frequency patterns. Um, then they took an external frequency, just a radio frequency, and they would get the radio frequency to match the vibrational frequency of the virus. And they thought, well, if I take the external frequency and I increase it, will the virus match that frequency and increase? And in fact, it did. And what they were able to achieve was they, by increasing the vibrational frequency of the virus, it heated up internally and the structure broke and they were eradicating the virus. And you would see this under microscopes, but unfortunately all this stuff went underground. Uh, well, actually Reif got ran out of business. Um, the FDA came in on them and a bunch of stuff. You guys know the story about that. Um, but a virus, a virus is really, really tiny. Um, If you, you hear the term coronavirus, and a coronavirus, uh, the name coronavirus, is there are like 100 species. Um, there are seven known to cause the common cold. Um, let me get some more. But um, the name corona is actually named after a crown. So the, the picture you see on the TV screens is looking at a, a virus with this crown shape. You have these spikes in it. And the spikes is what attaches to the, your cells. So, um, let me put some notes here. Um, 
the first thing about a virus, a virus infection, is that the main point is that the virus has to enter the system. That's the first thing. It has to enter into your system. And so how's it going to get in there, right? It's got to go through your membrane system, right? So you have your, your, uh, your, your sinus cavities, your eyes, your mouth, right? It kind of comes in, but even your digestive system. So your, your entire, uh, your, entire your, your, your sinus cavity, your lungs, your bronchioles, your entire GI tract, your bladder is a cavity. And that cavity is lined with a layer called the mucosal layer. And that mucosal layer has some very specialized immune cells in there. And those cells are there to, to throw it out, things that are kind of coming in that shouldn't begin, right? So the virus has got to get through that barrier system and get into the body before it can start to attack the cells. So having a very intact barrier system is imperative, not just to this virus, to any virus, to any infectious agent, to even environmental chemicals. Okay, that's why you hear us talk a lot about it in the office, is, okay, is barrier systems. Okay? Now, the unfortunate part is, one of the things that is known to break down the barrier system right, is stress. So the stress hormone cortisol okay, literally breaches down the proteins and it breaches the barrier, allowing environmental chemicals, bacteria, and yes, viruses to come into the system. That's the conundrum, right? So we're living in a world today where we're all crazy stressed, right? Whether it's the virus, whether it's traveling, and more importantly, the economics of all this. And, and, and not knowing day to day what's, what's next and how long things are gonna take. And so that in and of itself, I mean, is a huge stress response. And it's different kinds of stress, right? There's, there's good stress. Gravity is stress that keeps our muscles and our bones strong. Now you go to the gym, you exercise, you get stronger, that's stress. Some people do, do well with work when they're under pressure for deadlines, they just can function better. That's you know, really kind of good stress, right? But when you have stress where you just have no control over anything, you know, that's a different kind of stress. All right, now we're gonna talk about supplements today, I get it, and we're gonna talk about all kinds of strategies I'm doing with supplements and stuff, but um, I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, so guys ask me questions. Um, but the supplements by themselves are not going to make up for, you know, lifestyle choices that we're making. Um, so yes, the diet, stress management, exercise, sunlight, hygiene, all of these things are important. Okay. Let me back up a little bit. Um, I know there were some other questions. Um, what is different about this particular virus versus the other kinds of viruses, the regular influenza virus? Um, the main thing that's differentiating it is the, is, is, it's how it spreads, right? In a more traditional influenza flu virus, it spreads more one person to one person to one person. So the rate transmission is a little slower. This particular virus has the ability to spread to three people versus one. So it becomes exponential. So then three people spread it and then you have nine people. And then nine people spread, and you have 27 people. So before you know, you have 27 people versus three people. So it's the rate of transmission that makes more people susceptible to it. Okay. Um, as far as the impact goes, as far as like, is this virus more dangerous than a flu virus? Really, no. Really, no. I'm, I'm going to get ahead, get ahead of myself a little bit here, but um, it, this has more to do with how, how your immune system reacts to it. Right? Many people die from the traditional influenza flu. Okay? The fact that you're having more people exponentially affected by this is that you'll see exponential numbers of people who have more serious consequences. But as far as the virus itself being more dangerous than another other virus that in this situation really is not. At least that's the research that I've been seeing to date. Um, let me see, there's some other questions here. Um, oh, um, how does the virus actually make us sick? Um, so as I said to you before, like the virus does not reproduce on its own, so it needs a host. So it needs to get inside your cell. So first it needs to get through the barrier system. So remind me to talk today about what we need to do to fix our barriers, but we need to get through the barrier system. 
then these spikes on the virus, okay, target specific receptors on the cell. We're not getting too technical today, but specifically they have an affinity for what is called ACE2, ACE2 receptors. These are prevalent in the respiratory system. That's why these coronaviruses have an affinity for the respiratory system and not some other place that other viruses might do, okay? So when it, when it finds a, this ACE receptor, the, the spikes on the virus can lock onto the receptor. And then it works its way and can penetrate inside the cell. Its job is to get inside that cell. And then what it does basically is it's, it's hijacking the internal mechanisms of your cell, specifically your DNA. These viruses, are, in essence, are basically just strands of DNA and RNA. They're not like a, a, a nucleus and other things. They are literally just strands of genetic material. Coronavirus is specifically RNA. This is why the testing um, that they're doing, the testing for the virus is known as PCR testing. So when they swab the nose and the cheeks and the mouth and stuff, right? Um, they're putting these samples through a testing mechanism called PCR. And what that testing is looking to do is to find fragments of RNA, right? Then the mechanism spins through a cycle of around 40 times, then it can kind of build a scaffolding of this RNA into a large enough structure that can actually identify it, okay? And so that's when they're given the diagnosis, you have the infection. Now, the, 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 the downside to this testing, um, well, there's a few things. Number one is they haven't been able to purify the virus meaning they can't actually purify it to the sense they can have an exact identification of the RNA. So when they do the PCR testing and again, fragments of RNA, right, it's not proof positive that it's the RNA from the virus. And you can shed fragments of RNA just from cellular materials. So you're gonna wind up having a lot of people testing positive that are considered false positives. In other words, just because the person has a positive uh, PCR for an RNA fragment doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's the SARS virus. It means it could be anything, but they're being labeled with COVID-9, right? Um, so you get a lot of false positives. Uh, that's why they want to try to correlate it to symptoms. So if a person has symptoms, if they think they had exposure, and it's a delayed process, 10 days, two weeks, and then they start getting symptoms, and typically symptoms that, that are pretty common is the fever, the body aches, you know, typical flu-like symptoms. Um, uh, another symptom that's been kind of been talked about is losing the sense of smell and taste. Uh, but if you're having those kinds of symptoms and you had a test that said, okay, here's a positive RNA, then they're gonna say that's pretty definitive, right? So symptoms have to correlate with the, uh, with the, with the testing. Um, but again, so the virus is basically hijacking the, 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 the it's hijacking the material inside the, your cell. Um, it's breaking it down for its own purposes, and then it's reformulating its own structure, its own genetic structure, okay? And it replicates itself that way, okay? And then it's a hundredfold. And when the cell can't sustain it because the energy inside the cell is being damaged, is the cell dies, it breaks, it ruptures, and the virus has come out a hundredfold and they can spread and infect other cells. And the same process keeps going on and on and on. Okay, so that's really the kind of the mechanism of the virus. Uh, some of the drug interventions that people that were looking at, not me, but uh, that the medicine is looking at, right, is in part is um, how do we block, how do we block the virus from attaching to the cell so we can prevent it from getting in. The drugs that exist presently, okay, for, for, for viruses, uh, are geared specifically at trying to slow down the replication of it, not the infection of it, to slow down the replication of it. Ultimately, it's the job of your immune system to handle the stuff, right? Well, if the drug works a little bit and can slow down the replication, then you're giving the immune system a chance to do its job. So they can kind of kind of work hand in hand to some degree. Um, Let's see what else, some kind of questions here. Um, what is a fever? Why do we have a fever? Um, well, again, the fever is actually your immune system. The fever is your immune system response. It's energy production by the immune system, okay? And it's raising temperature. 
um, it's a byproduct of the immune system response. Uh, because of bacteria, um, most bacteria cannot live over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and so obviously the nature of that uh, is, is, is therapeutic. Um, not sure about viruses, but no, that's actually, actually like, let me take that back. Actually, um, there's a lot of principles that bacteria cannot live uh, in high heat. Um, uh, I know this kind of sounds kind of strange, but there's been some PhDs that are working on these premises. I know it's been talked about in about 55 countries that specifically coronaviruses, respiratory viruses, okay, one of the Achilles heels is heat. Heat. So like your nasal passages, breathing in cool air in the winter months, right, becomes a recipe for viruses to harbor. Um, but that's why they think in more warmer weather and the sciences warm up, it's not an environment that's conducive for the viruses. And so that's why they think the weather patterns change. So they're doing things by, they have, they have done experiments testing where they do heat nasally. So people are using, I kid you not, people use um, a hairdryer and you just blow the hot air up your nose for a few seconds, breathe it in, pull the, the hairdryer away, relax, go back, breathe it in, ready, relax. Um, the idea is to do that for about five minutes on relatively high heat. The studies have shown that the bacteria cannot live over 133 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and so sometimes people get into infrared saunas, dry saunas, and try to breathe in hot air. So um, a lot of research on that, fairly proven that it works. Okay. Um, another thing, just because I'm on that matter, is I just heard this morning, by the way, is they now know that there's another Achilles heel to this virus, and it happens to be ultraviolet light, the sun. Get outside. Get outside. Spend some time in the sun. You know, I sent to you earlier in an email that, you know, um, self-distancing is one thing. You know, and it does not mean hibernation. Okay, hibernation does, does serves us no good as human beings, right? We need to be out, get outside, be in the sun, get, go for a walk. Um, so before I, get into, let's, you know, before I get into nutritional stuff, let's just talk about the lifestyle management thing. Because if you don't do these lifestyle things, the nutritional process is not going to do you a whole lot of good. We want to do them you know, together, right? Um, so let's just start with food. Let's just start with diet. You go to the grocery store. I mean, you go to the grocery store these days. You know, what do you see? You know, what's missing? What's gone? The toilet paper, right? And what foods are gone from the shelves? It's all the processed foods. It's all the boxed, packaged foods are gone. And what's there in abundance? Fruits and vegetables. The very thing that we should all be eating is the fruits and the vegetables to support our immune systems, right? We don't want to keep driving inflammation. These things are anti-inflammatory. We want the fruits and the vegetables. Everybody's leaving it there. I drive up the highway. I drive by Chick-fil-A, and the line of cars is out in the street. You drive past Krispy Kreme, <laughs> the line is out on the highway. Yeah, I get that where, that where people are stressed and they're eating stress. But see, this is the, this is the, the, the conundrum is that, is that, yes, we're under stress. That's a reality, and we're going to produce stress hormones like cortisol, and cortisol is going to have implications. And one of the things that it does is it's going to break down our barrier systems, making us more vulnerable, right? So the, we need to work on and practice as best as we can stress management. I'm stressed. I get stressed. I'm a human being, too. I listen to things. I can feel myself getting worked up. But I have to just take a deep breath, deep breathing, deep breathing. Breathe in through your nose deep, slow and steady. Try to feel your abdomen. Try to hold it for four, five, six seconds, or longer if you can. Slowly exhale through your mouth. So you empty the tank. Relax, compose yourself. You might even get a little lightheaded, right? which is an indication that you're not getting enough oxygen in. It'll pass. Repeat that you know, four or five times. Do that a couple of times a day. Breathing, okay? sets your nervous system's rhythm. Respiration and your nervous system are interconnected. So if I'm breathing like this, right, my stress level is gonna go up, my nervous system gets weaker. If I can breathe slower, we'll modulate that, okay? 
movement is imperative. This is a um, Scientific American. You guys can see this. All right, it says evolved to exercise. Why humans must stay active to be healthy. If we're sitting inside, not getting the sunlight, hibernating, watching the news, getting stressed out, okay, recipe for disaster. Okay, you can't supplement your way out of that. Healthy diet. One of the things I just read recently, by the way, is, um, I have here someplace. Um, one of the things about the virus's replication, um, yeah, they're looking at drugs, but something like nitric oxide has been shown to inhibit viral replication. Now, nitric oxide is a gas that is produced in our cardiovascular system, in our nervous system, okay? Um, exercise induces nitric oxide, right? Inflammation in our bodies, gut, cardiovascular, whatever, inflammation is driving a inflammatory nitric oxide called inducible nitric oxide. Right? So it is important that we counter the inducible nitric oxide with the good nitric oxide, which is called endothelial and neuronal nitric oxide. Fancy language, but like, like we have products, the nitric balance, we use optic nitric, these things increases nitric oxide levels, right? Uh, things that help to relax the blood vessels in the plus bone. But nitric oxide has been shown to slow down the replication of viruses. So what's interesting is there are foods, foods that we can eat that naturally increase nitric oxide levels. Now, many people are familiar with beets. Sure, beets. Great, beets, they do. Beet juice, right? Beets violates the blood vessels because it's increasing nitric oxide levels. I just learned, and I didn't know this, I just learned that arugula, arugula is like 10 times more impactful in raising nitric oxide levels than beets. Number one, arugula. Start eating more arugula salad, right? Butter leaf lettuce, high in nitric oxides. Cilantro, spring, uh, spring greens, and... Uh, and beets, there are some really foods that we eat all the time. We should eat more of them right now to increase our nitric oxide levels. So imagine if we're eating some of these foods, increasing nitric oxide levels, right? We're working on some stress management, doing some deep breathing, uh, stretching, maybe some yoga, turn the TV off, listening to some good music that we enjoy, it makes us feel good, having some visual time with people, get outside, get some sunlight, go for a walk in the park, these are all really good proactive measures. That's gonna do way more good for your immune system uh, than just trying to pound down thousands of dollars worth of supplements, okay? Now, before I do get into the supplement things, let me just see, there's a couple other questions coming in. Um, I think what's really important, I think this is, I, this is one thing I just wanna make sure that I don't miss. This is such an important point, an important concept. Um, when you have an infection, Let's just say, in this case, the viral infection, specifically this uh, SARS virus. The response, you have an immune system. We all have an immune system. And the whole purpose of this immune system is to fight things that are foreign, right, to keep us healthy, right? That's why you have highly selected immune cells that are in this barrier system. So that's, your, that's the outside world, right? And then we have other kinds of specialized immune systems that work more deeper into the body when they pass through the barrier systems. But our immune system is, um, it's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible what it can do. Um, you know, and I guess just to kind of keep things a little bit simple now, I know I'm kind of segmenting a little bit here, but the immune system, the analogy is like the immune system is like a football team. Right? When, it, when it first comes onto the field, you all have the same uniforms on, and, and uh, you can identify that's your team, right? But under closer observation, you see that there's some players are on an offensive team and some players are on a defensive team, and who's a quarterback, and who's a running back, and who's the lineman. And then you look on the sidelines, and you've got a head coach, and you've got an offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator, and you're communicating to people. So your immune system is really the same thing. There's just a lot of communication going on back and forth and strategies. And, things, right? But for many of you who are patients in this office, right, you know when I talk about the immune system all the time because it's probably the number one thing I speak about here with everyone, regardless of the issue, because the immune system is connected to everything, right? You guys know that the immune system and your hormone system and your brain and the nervous system 
is one integral system. And roughly 70% of your immune system is in your gut, right? So you've got a gut, immune, brain, hormone, super system. It's one system, right? So it is important. That's why the immune system is connected to everything, not just the viruses, but to, to, to brain degeneration, right? So we're concerned about dementia, and Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, these diseases, right? We know that now Parkinson's disease starts in the gut. That's where it starts. And it's a neurological degenerative disease, but it starts in the gut. Right? But it's an immune organ and it's immune response. So when we have brain fog and, and memory problems and behavioral problems and things, and people walk in, they're saying to me, you know, my brain is lit up. I mean, the reality is they're telling me that there's inflammation in the brain. And that means that there is an immune response, right? So many of you heard me say is that, um, 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 what is inflammation? Inflammation is an immune system reaction. The immune system creates an inflammatory response, right? And the inflammation drives the immune system towards more inflammatory responses. So in the case of the virus, right, when we're exposed to something foreign, in this case, a virus comes in, gets to the cell, walks on, gets inside the cell, starts its own replication, comes down, starts to go. At some point, as more cells get infected, your immune system sees that. Yeah. And then it starts to act on it. And so you have the first line of defense coming in called macrophages. Right, um, the system of your immune system is called the Th1 side of your immune system, and those are the natural killer cells and the macrophage. They're in it to kill stuff. Okay, the other side of your immune system is called the Th2 side of your immune system. They're the ones that make the antibodies. Okay, they're giving instructions to the Th1 guys who to go after. Right, um, so when the immune system turns on, it's going after this thing. So in a proper immune response, if we get infected, the immune system turns on, it's driving these inflammatory chemicals, right? It's using up energy, we don't feel so good. We get a fever, I'm tired, oh, I feel terrible, stuff like that, right? But then at some point, you get enough antibodies and the immune system gets progressive, it takes care of it. And then you have regulating cells that come in and say, okay, enough is enough. And then you quiet down this inflammatory response, you call it resolving the inflammatory response. And we get past it and we move on. And now we have acquired immunity to that infectious agent. And if we get exposed to it again in the future, our immune system remembers it and it takes care of business. That's why getting sick periodically is not such a bad thing. Okay? The problem, not just in this virus, but in all viruses and all infections, is that there's going to be you know, a subset of people that, you see, it's not that these people are immune suppressed. It's not that the old population of people are more vulnerable because they're immune suppressed. That is incorrect, okay? What these, what's happening to these people, that's why even younger people, is they can't resolve the inflammatory response, right? They start to lose buffers. They start to lose, the hormones drop, things are changing, that influences things. And so the buffer is that kind of controls the exaggerated immune system response starts to deplete, and the immune system is allowed to take off. So as this immune system that, that initially responded to the agent, in this case the virus, there was an appropriate response, the immune system started, but it started and it started to escalate. And we, the person has lost, lost the ability to control that inflammatory response. And so now you're getting collateral damage from the inflammatory response. So it actually causes the viral pneumonia, the pneumonia, the pneumonitis, the inflammation of the lungs, is the immune system reaction there. It's not the virus, it's the immune system. The immune system is what's causing the problem. The virus is just the, it's just the, the trigger, okay? So really the name of the game is how do we do two things? How do we support our immune systems so that we can not get the virus, Okay, but uh, more importantly, how do we support our immune system so that we can control the inflammatory response so it does the appropriate thing and it doesn't exaggerate? And that's where the heavy strategies come in, right? So we know that the lifestyle things we just spoke about are really good at the prevention end of it, right? Preventing, uh, keeping our immune system strong and our barrier system strong so we can kind of reduce the infection itself, right? But what do we really do when we get the infection? And how do we kind of mitigate that? Now, 
you know, the reality is when people come into the office who already have stuff going on, right? You all have stuff with your various systems, you got information in your gut, hormones are imbalanced, and so on and so forth. And these are all the strategies that we work on anyways, okay? But um, I'll just kind of tell you some things I'm doing, okay? Uh, let's see, there was a couple other questions that we had in time. And feel free to chat, you know, just ask me the questions. If anything is coming up, we need clarification on something or any opinions. Um, um, now you guys don't realize that when I'm looking at the screen here is I don't see anyone. I can just see it myself speaking. Um, uh, makes it a little bit odd. Um, I'm a people person. I don't like to look at someone face to face. And uh, anyway, uh, let's see what else we have here. Oh, somebody was asking about the antibody test kits. Um, yeah, so one of the labs that we work with. Um, they were granted the rights, they weren't granted the rights, I mean, they were requested by the Mayo Clinic and a few other people to, to start these antibody test kits. Um, we were really excited because it was like, man, we were like the first ones on the block being able to offer this. Um, and just uh, technicalities with the FDA, because uh, their tests were coming out um, uh, without the FDA approval originally, but the FDA was speeding it up. Uh, they were using a dry blood spot, um, because they didn't want people going to a lab for blood tests, and the FDA still just kind of put the brakes on because they want to analyze a few things, and so this can help. But moving forward, antibody testing um, should be out within a week. Um, and then people ask me, well, what's the point of that? What's the benefit of it? How is it different from the, um, the PCR testing? Well, again, the PCR testing, as I explained a little bit earlier, uh, is trying to test and say whether or not you actually are infected. Again, it has a lot of false negatives, false positives. Uh, if a person has uh, not the corona or COVID-19 virus, but they got another influenza virus or they got a common cold, uh, you know, they can still test positive and they're being labeled with COVID. So a lot of flaws, but that's just to say that you actually have the infection. But an antibody test does, okay, because a lot of people haven't had any symptoms, right? Or maybe mild symptoms and they weren't sure if it was it or not it, or I just have a cold, right? But an antibody test now is actually looking at your did you have an immune response to it? So it is specific in the sense that if you have antibodies, positive antibodies for this, then yes, you did, you were infected, okay? But now you've had an immune system response to it, you produce those antibodies, and now really you have immunity to it going forward, okay? Um, if you had mild symptoms, if you had mild symptoms um, and you have a positive antibody test and you've been, look, what they're telling us now is that, right, is the symptoms are gonna last about 10 days. If you're asymptomatic past that point for three days, uh, you're good to go. If you have a positive antibody test uh, and you're past symptoms for three days, you're good. You can leave the house, you can go see somebody, you have immunity to it. That's what they're hoping. That's what's gonna hopefully get more people out and about and doing this, that's the control mechanism. Um, I think I just saw a question. I just let me see if I can. Uh, um. Hey, Cynthia. Yeah. Can you come here for a second? I don't want to. Uh, do I hit this chat here? Just like that. Yeah, sure. Like that. The question things. Ah, uh, look who's online with us. It's Robert Pucci. <laughs> My brother Robert Pucci from California is online. How you doing, man? All right. He asks, if someone in my household exhibits symptoms, how should we behave? Be kind. That's your older brother telling you. Be kind. <laughs> if someone tests positive and isn't, if someone tests positive and is sent home from the hospital, how should we behave? I'm gonna say, if someone tests positive and they're sent home from the hospital, how should we behave? Well, if you're in the same house with them, chances are you have the exposure, right? You're gonna get it, right? So you would do the same thing, well, that's then definitely social distancing and, and, and quarantining yourself for the 14 days. Um, but definitely, I would definitely try to get that antibody test. Um, that's what you want to know. If you if you if, if you take if you get the antibody test and then you you, you did test positive, right? And uh, you've been asymptomatic for at least three days. I think you're you're good. Nothing to worry about. Even if the person 
came home. Nothing to worry about. You have the immunity. Uh, what they don't know going forward is like next year, does, does your immunity right today also going to support you for next year? Uh, you, you don't know, right? I mean, the, the common everyday influenza viruses, right? Every year they want you to go for a flu shot anyways, right? So they, if they're giving you a flu shot this year, uh, next year they want you another flu shot, right? Because viruses mutate. And so they don't know what this virus is going to do and how it's going to mutate and how well it's going to mutate. But the research so far, the study so far is saying that they don't really think so. And if it mutates, they don't think it's going to mutate that much. Um, what they're hoping, I guess, is that it's like a uh, one-time thing in the sense of a chicken virus, like the chicken pox virus. Um, that you have built-in immunity against it. Right? But coronaviruses in general are just a, a, a cold kind of viruses that, is, uh, that have affinity for the lungs, and these things can, can mutate. You know, by the way, just um, you know, how these things begin, like, you know, again, they need a host, right? So oftentimes they're in animals, or, or even in plants. They're in mosquitoes, a virus. They're in a, a bat, right? And a bat. Um, what happens is, is that when they leave the animal, they mutate. So it's the mutated form that infects the human being. Not the exact virus that came from the bat, but it goes through stages of mutations. So it's the mutated form that becomes a problem to, to us. And we haven't seen it before. It's a new kind of a mutation, okay? Um, uh, Robin Garmiz, how you doing? Uh, steps to take for food handling. Well, uh, gosh, I think I, huh? Um, well, I think, you know, just common sense stuff, right? Obviously, is, 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 is um, you know, if you're washing your hands before, wash your hands after, just wash the foods, especially your, your fruits and your vegetables, your fresh foods, right? You want to give them a good wash. Um, uh, you know, I guess you're better off probably not eating raw so much. Um, I would probably uh, steam the vegetables. No, it's not. It's not well, they're asking me a second question about just food handling. Um, uh, Donna Burke is asking about infrared saunas, recommendations, temperatures, and times. Temperature and time, I mean, I guess the, the, the virus has been shown 133 degrees. Um, some some saunas can get to that, some saunas can't get to that, but certainly if you have an infrared sauna, that is a great thing to use. Length of time mm, depends upon your own, you know. Uh, Fortitude, you know, 20 minutes would be great, uh, 30, 20 minutes, but you know, if you can't stand 20 minutes, then just 10 minutes is fine. Anything helps. Um, uh, Patty is asking, hi, is there any validity to blood type and the degree of the case? Not, not, not to my awareness, not to my awareness. Um, some of that stuff, I think, still goes back to like some old theories, um, you know, even the ideas of of type, blood type dieting and stuff like that. Uh, you, you know, the main thing is this, right? Is um, you guys may be talking about your nervous system has two sides. You've got a sympathetic side and a parasympathetic side, right? You know, let me tell you something kind of interesting. At least it's interesting to me. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it is to you, right? Is again, I said to you how the brain and the hormones and the gut immune are all one system, right? So we do forget about brain, brain physiology in our immune system. Right, and make it a little bit simple. It's like you know we have our brain has two sides to it: the left and the right hemisphere. Right. Well, your left hemisphere of your brain is linear. Is your linear thinking? It's analytical, right? That's why we test people with mathematical questions. Right. But your left brain is your gas pedal. So your left brain is actually going to stimulate your immune system. Right. Turns it on. That's what you want. The right side of your brain, okay, is the creative side of your brain. Right? And that's the gas pedal. That's your inhibition. Right? And what we typically see in a higher percentage of people is the right hemisphere of the brain is more fatigued. The interesting thing is that your, 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 your right hemisphere of your brain um, has a direct connection to your gut. That's why gut health is so important because it speaks right into that right hemisphere. So if there's gut issues, we're feeding poor gut issues, we're going to tend to have more inflammation in the right side of our brains. The right side of the brain gets more tired. We lose the brakes. Right? Day to day, we see it when we observe people who are saying and doing things they shouldn't say or do. Right? Like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you just said that. Right? Because they lost the brakes. Right? Well, same thing happens to the immune system. So if you don't want the immune system, we want it to turn on, but we don't want it to turn on and not turn off. 
right? That's why the right brain, now what do you do, right? So we can do like just some activation to the right brain. Meaning like if you do some sensory input or vibration input on the left side of your body, this is my left side, I don't know if you see it that way, on the left side of my body, that's gonna fire into my right hemisphere. So I can do vibration, I could take a comb or a brush, I can stroke my arm, just tap it so I'm feeling things. I can put my, my hand under warm water, cold water, warm water, cold water, all that's just firing a signal into my right brain. If I take uh, my earbuds and I put an earbud just in my left ear and I turn on classical music, creative style music, that's firing into my auditory center in my right brain, firing my right brain. These are really cool neurological tools to help improve our immune system's response. Um, I'm kind of just going on now, right? I'm rambling, huh? but uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, Christy's asking if you had asthma or pneumonia in the past, does that make you more vulnerable to this type of virus being worse since it gets into the lungs? Well, two parts. Uh, if you've had pneumonia in the past, no, you're not more susceptible because you had the pneumonia, you got the infection, you got over, you got past. It's a done deal, right? If you had asthma, now asthma is, the thing about asthma is this. Okay, you go back to your immune system. Okay, try, try and keep this simple. I don't have a PowerPoint to show you things, right? But, uh, one part of your immune system, we call it the Th1, T helper one side. Again, those are your natural killer cells. They want to come in and kill stuff. The other side is called your Th2 side. They're the ones that make the antibodies. They're giving instructions for you to go after, okay? It's the tendency for the body to become Th2 dominant. So things like stress and lifestyle issues and not getting out in the sun and doing all these different things, right? All these things kind of push us into a Th2 dominance. The Th2 dominant world is producing these inflammatory chemicals, right? Your immune system produces both non-inflammatory signaling chemicals and inflammatory signaling chemicals. We need both, but we want them balanced. So the Th2 side, when it gets to be over, just going and going and going, is producing a tremendous amount of these inflammatory cytokines. So that's where we have, that's where asthma is. Asthma develops out of a Th2 dominance. So you people that have, you people, I'm sorry, um, people who have autoimmunity, and that's like 80% of the people who come into this office, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's thyroid, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, whatever, um, or even now knowing, thinking that Alzheimer's is an autoimmune disease, right? Most cardiovascular diseases are autoimmune diseases. Right? When the immune system is imbalanced, when the immune system is stuck in this TH2 dominance, it's in a pro-inflammatory state. So in autoimmunity, you're going to see more exacerbations of these symptoms. So if it's rheumatoid, you're going to have more problems with disruption of your joints. If it's multiple sclerosis, it's going to progress and you're going to have more demyelinization of these neurons in your brain and the symptoms cascade. Right? But even, even in an asthma state, it's going to perpetuate an asthma state. So the answer to that question, again, Christy, is that exposure to pneumonia, no, no big deal. If you have asthma or had asthma, you really got to give consideration to the fact that you, you really want to pay attention to this immune modulated stuff. Okay. Um, uh, Donna asked, if you, have, if you have immunity, are you still contagious? My understanding at this point is no. You're not. Um, you're only contagious in the early stages. Most of the time, you're actually contagious in the incubated period. Okay. Once you start getting the infection, you become less contagious. And then, when you pass that point and you're free of the symptoms for three days, you have the autoimmune and you have the antibody response to it. You have the immunity to it. You're, you're not contagious anymore. Um, that can change. I mean, you know, because new information is coming out, new things that they see this virus. But from what the research and I'm just what I'm studying today is that's my understanding of it. Um, let's see what else. Um, uh, let's go into, let's go, let's go into this. Let's go into supplements, okay? Um, I think this is really important. I'll give you a couple of strategies about what I'm doing. Again, this is what I'm doing. I certainly encourage my patients to do these things. Again, as patients, you all are individuals and you all know that you have different individual needs, right? But if we're just out of the gate trying to say globally, like uh, kind of what do we need to do? Uh, let's give you the top, Top 10, <laughs> David Letterman, the top 10 list. Um, there is so much evidence coming out about the importance of vitamin D. I know it's a big deal, vitamin D is a big deal. I mean, it is just coming out like 
crazy. Um, vitamin D does so many things. It actually is a, it's actually a pro hormone. Uh, one of the main things vitamin D does is it balances your immune system. So basically, it, 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 it controls the regulating cells that is controlling the TH1 and the TH2. The regulating cells is like the conductor of an orchestra. Okay, so you want that conductor to be able to communicate. So vitamin D and vitamin A balances out that regulatory cells. Also, the antioxidant glutathione directly impacts these um, these regulating cells. So vitamin D is critical, vitamin A is critical, and glutathione is critical. Okay, how much should I take? Okay, depending upon your, your blood test, if you don't have a blood test, look at your markers. Um, um, I'm taking, right now, I'm taking 10,000 IUs per day of vitamin D. Okay, I'm also basing in part on my genetic test, which shows that I genetically have a, a weak ability to absorb vitamin D, so I'm just, getting my vitamin D at 10,000 as the main thing in spouse. Okay. Uh, vitamin A, I'm doing about 5,000. I use the vitamin A. Glutathione, I use the liposomal form that you have in the office. Um, I'm doing about six pumps of glutathione twice a day. Okay, that's kind of like a baseline as my prevention. Okay. Um, what would I do if I actually got infected and I had the infection and I had symptoms? Okay. I would crank on this. Now I'm telling you from the research, and I know some very high respected doctors in the functional medicine world with cardiovascular disease and stuff, okay, and they are known, and I concur, that they're going as high as 100,000 IUs of vitamin D for like three days. You heard me correctly. You heard me correctly. 100,000. Okay, people come in and they're taking a thousand IUs a day of vitamin D and they get all nervous about taking 5,000 a day because the medical doctor is saying, ooh, 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 about vitamin D, right? I'm telling you, in the therapeutic intervention, people are going from 60 to 100,000 IUs of vitamin D. Your vitamin A, I would bang it up to about 30,000 30, IUs. The glutathione, I would take six, eight, ten hits four times a day on the glutathione. Okay. Um, what about vitamin C? Again, if you, get your, if, you, if you can get a hand on vitamin C, you know, it's off the shelves, right? But vitamin C is, is, is important, you know that. Vitamin C also supports uh, your TH1 side, so it helps the fighter sides, right? So these are your, your vitamin C, your vitamin A, your vitamin D, your glutathione, it's all helping that part of, the, part of the immune system that fights the infection. But the cool thing about vitamin D and vitamin A and glutathione and vitamin C is it's also kind of calming down the TH2 so you don't get the exaggerated inflammatory response where the complications really come from. Um, again, the foods we talked about that help with nitric oxide, the arugula, and the leaf, the lettuces, those kinds of things are terrific. Um, let's see, what else? Um, uh, another thing I'm taking is certainly is adrenal support. Why wouldn't I? Right? We're all stressed. We're all taxed out. You think your adrenal glands are going to start fatiguing? Yeah, I want my adrenal glands working as best that they can so they can adapt as best that they can. So I'm taking my adrenal glandular supports and my adaptogen supports. Um, um, gosh, I'm taking a bunch of stuff, right? So on the other hand, too, now we know that uh, you know, people ask about turmeric and resveratrol uh, and fish oils. Now, what, what those guys do, um, if you're not taking those presently and if you're not taking those as a uh, preventative strategy, if you are infected, if you're showing, showing, showing signs, um, definitely resveratrol, okay? definitely high quality fish oil supplements and, and turmeric, okay? Because turmeric is a natural anti-inflammatory, but these particular products, turmeric, resveratrol, and the, uh, the, the EPAs and DHAs that are found in fish oil are, are known as resolve ins, resolve ins. They resolve the inflammatory response. That's what we want. This is a article that I have in the office. Many have seen it. Uh, it's from a Harvard Medical Journal. Uh, this is about chronic inflammation and chronic diseases. You can kind of see this. I don't know if you can or not. But the simplicity is what they're saying here is in their research is that to treat excessive inflammation, we don't want to block the inflammatory response. We want to stimulate the resolution pathways. So this is all chronic diseases, but it holds true in this current situation with this virus. Right? 
You'd want your immune system to respond. If you get an infection, you want your immune system to protect you so you don't get the damage. There's gonna be an inflammatory response. You're not gonna feel so good for a little bit, but you don't want to exaggerate. You want resolvement, okay? And so that's why these strategies are, 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 are in place. Um, let's see here. You guys have any other questions? Am I hitting on enough stuff for you? Um, you know me, I can talk for three hours. Uh, Let's see. Well, let's see. Um, hello, Ashley. Hey. All right, uh, so Ashley is asking, uh, she's pregnant. I'm very happy for her. Uh, is there anything extra or different that I can be doing? Uh, tough question there. Um, obviously, it's a bit difficult uh, being that you're pregnant and you know, obviously legally with nutritional products, there's a whole lot of stuff. I think the best thing for you, Ashley, is you know, one is you do due diligence in, in, your, in your distancing, you do your due diligence in hygiene, and uh, uh, basically the macro management. The macro manager, right? It's the get outside, get fresh air, get in the sunlight, move your body. This is even if you weren't fighting trying to prevent a virus. This is just good, good for everything, right? Uh, you know, do relaxation techniques, yoga, stretching, breathing, do those kinds of different things. Keep in contact socially and stuff like that. You know, um, again, I got to be careful with you know when we were pregnant, making recommendations and stuff, but you know. Uh, Certainly, anything that I'm talking about, you could do, you know, certainly these, these nutrients, I mean, vitamins and seeds and stuff are all, you know, they're in the foods. I don't see a problem with them, but if you want to certainly turn, I speak with your, uh, 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 your, your gynecologist and your fertility specialists that are working with you, um, just ask them about those and see if they have any contraindications to them. I don't think they should, but I would certainly pass it on to the person. Okay. Um, Yes, I had a couple of the thoughts, but um, oh, one thing I did forget to mention uh, uh, regarding supplementation are uh, short chain fatty acids. Uh, what the heck is that? Well, people who are in the office kind of know what they are, but if you're not in the office, um, short chain fatty acids are well, what they sound like they're fatty acids and they're short chain, but they are made in your gut, specifically in your colon. So there are certain kinds of bacteria that, uh, they, they, that digest fiber and they produce short-chain fatty acids. And the short-chain fatty acids are fuel for your colon cells. And so it helps to colonize more and more good bacteria. And, the, and the, the energy of your colon cells has a direct impact on your brain, which I said earlier, controls your immune system and your gut's immune system. So short-chain fatty acid production is imperative for healthy immune response. Now, yes, I take short chain fatty acids as a supplement. Okay, again, we're having difficulty with inventory. We don't have it today. But what could you do if you don't have access to taking short chain fatty acids directly? Well, I just said, what do they feed on? Fiber. Okay, so if you're not doing what the mass is doing and eating the processed foods, and you go to the grocery store and you get all the vegetables in, right? You're adding fiber to your diet. And if you want to take a fiber supplement and add that in, great. I do that. I put a fiber supplement to my shake. All right. I'm feeding these bacteria um, with the fiber they need so I can make more short chain fatty acids. Okay. So that's fuel for my colon. It's also a way to help prevent colon cancer. Uh, so that's important um, against your defense. So, again, another strategy is vitamin D, vitamin A, glutathione, vitamin C. And I did leave out one other thing. I apologize. I'm just <laughs> I'm glad I wrote a note down here, which is melatonin melatonin yes the sleep hormone melatonin okay research current mm, powerful um yes we think about melatonin for sleep the melatonin is actually more of an immune hormone than it is for sleep it just is that in your brain the pineal gland makes melatonin 
in the evening and it does contribute to your circadian cycle, right? But what happens at night when we sleep? We're also in repair mode and our immune systems are being activated, right? And that's why if we're not sleeping really well, we have immune compromised. This is all the stuff, right? So again, macro mass sleep. If you can't get sleep when we're stressed out, then you do the best you can during the day. If you gotta take a nap, you take a nap, right? If you're exercising, by the way, which I'm still doing, is I'm not going overboard. I'm not gonna excess extreme because I don't wanna have my immune system putting energy into repairing damage from over exercising. So I want movement, I wanna exercise, but I wanna kinda of keep it in moderation, right? I want my immune system to kinda of come in and be as stealth as it can to manage the condition. I don't want it to be distracted a lot of that stuff. I don't want it to have to eat my immune system to put attention to junk food. I want it to put attention to viruses. Okay, but melatonin is also manufactured by your thymus gland, which is the primary gland that makes immune cells. Okay, it's very large when you're a baby. And it's in your gut, it's your intestinal cells. So melatonin has been shown to be a powerful immune modulator. So what would I do if I was actively infected? I would take melatonin, how much I would take it through the day, and I would take upwards therapeutically of 100, thousand IUs of melatonin, okay? If I'm taking it in a preventative ma uh, measure, which I'm doing, I'm taking 10 milligrams. So the normal dosage that people take for sleep is like three milligrams, maybe five milligrams max for sleep, right? Well, if I wanna do more from a immune modulation standpoint, just a preventative, I'm going to 10 milligrams. And if I was infected, I was having symptoms, 100,000. Now these high dosages, remember, are only short term. Two, three days. You're not doing this for seven days. It's two, three days, you're ramping this up, and then you're coming back down again to more of your maintenance dosages, right? And the idea is to control the inflammatory response. It's not so much shorting the, it's not so much shortening the duration of the, the infection or how long it takes to get past it, because that's just the normal life cycle of producing antibodies and getting a immune response. What you want to make sure that happens is that this, it doesn't turn on and that doesn't just keep going. And that's the, that strategy. So, boom. so yes, if you take this in high doses for a short while, you will feel better in a short time frame. Okay. Um, any other questions? I think I'm kind of out of big suggestions. I think I hit on everything that I needed to hit on today. Um, you know, what I will suggest is this, you know, for all of you. Um, we don't know exactly, um, as we don't, who does? We don't know exactly when um, the, the lift will be, the emergency state will be lifted where we can kind of kind of get back to some ordinary business here. Um, uh, we do, we are suspect that our practice uh, will be allowed to resume uh, probably earlier than other businesses are because it's a health, Related business, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we will communicate that to you and let you guys know. Um, I'm hopeful that some of these are going to change in the next few weeks. Uh, there's some signs of that that we're hearing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a politician saying anything, and I'm not I'm just saying things that I've already heard through organizations uh, that I'm in. And, uh, we'll see where we go with this thing. Um, but we're here. Okay, we're coming into the office, or Cynthia's on the phone with you, a lot of you, and back and forth, and there are patients need supplements, and they're coming in, they're picking them up, they're putting them in the vestibule. I am encouraging all of you um, to stay in touch with us. I have been doing a video, uh, uh, Zooming with patients 101, we're going over their lab tests, any questions they have, you know, we're not away, we're here. Uh, this might even become the new norm. I mean, that's, that is, this, is, this, this, this Zoom, this video conferencing, uh, this telemedicine, uh, it's been something that's been peaking you now for the last 10 years, and, uh, it's, and, and patients are looking for it. I guess it's, it's certainly it's, it's convenient. And there's a need for being in the office, and um, certainly our therapies are quite beneficial. And uh, as many of you know, the pulse electromagnetic frequency, the PEMF, a powerful, powerful therapeutic intervention tool. It does you know, make our immune system stronger. When I finish this uh, webinar with you guys, I'm getting on it. I'm going to be on it for a half hour before before I take off. And uh, so certainly when this gets back and getting you guys back on it, it's gonna be really great. But in the meantime, we have to do this thing, right? But there's also some tests to consider, right? Um, you know, Cynthia's put out an email to you guys that, I mean, this is if you want it, um, but 
uh, at this present time, certainly a, uh, you know, we can't go to the lab to do blood testing, but there's so many functional tests that we do that you do at home, right? These test kits are either sent by us to you or the labs now are making arrangements to send them uh, no cost shipping directly to patients. Um, so we can still do, you know, uh, organic acid testing and stool testing, uh, saliva testing for hormones and stuff. So, you know, considering stress, I think an adrenal profile, adrenal stress index, the salivary test you guys do, um, is really good to kind of where your stress levels are and then you might want to ramp up more on certain, on certain things. Um, if you're concerned about vitamin D and taking too much vitamin D, one of our labs does do a blood spot. So it's just a prick of the finger, blood spot on a, on a piece of paper, it dries and they're analyzing what I'm going to do it that way um, this weekend. I'm going to test my own vitamin D levels using a blood spot. So again, it can be, you know, so if you worry about vitamin D levels being too high, that's a great way to kind of do that. Um, organic acids, again, another really wonderful test. That's a urinary test, the organic acids. Uh, it measures the metabolites uh, that you're excreting. Those are the breakdowns of hormones and vitamins and nutri uh, uh, nutritional products and, 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 and chemicals in our brains. And, Stuff. So an organic acid is a great window into understanding your, the health of your gut. We have yeast overgrowth. It's a great indication of the, the health of your mitochondria, the, the power plants that make energy. That's pretty critical because if your cells don't have enough mitochondrial support, then they can't have the energy to prevent this thing from replicating. So mitochondrial support is also another important thing. So again, I take that too. I take an extra, you know, extra amounts of coenzyme Q10 along with what's called PQQ. Uh, these things have been shown uh, quite readily in research to be a powerful way of supporting our mitochondria. Um, and again, the stool test. I mean, the stool test is the stool test. I mean, that's such great information. Um, your immune, 70, 80% of your immune system is in your gut. And so a good look at it is, you know, is, your, is your gut environment. Again, this is not something pressing you have to do today, but we're here and we want to take a look at these things. I'm always thinking in terms of after we get past this, and we will get past this, everyone. We will get past this. It's inevitable. We will get past it, okay? hopefully sooner than later. I think the panic and fear comes from the economy. Right? We can hopefully bounce back with some sense of some reasonable return to this. Um, um, but, my, my, but I'm also saying that, you know, what do we do? What do we do going forward? Right? What do we do as far as getting a better understanding of this and how do we support ourselves immunologically? This is not just the COVID virus. This is, you know, autoimmune disease is, is, is exploding. We talk about a, a an epidemic, right? The Western civilized world, I mean, it is like more people are diagnosed with some type of autoimmune disease than cancer and heart disease combined. Okay, Alzheimer's, whether it's autoimmune or not autoimmune, but it's an immune response in the brain, okay, is expected to hit 50% of the population over the age of 70. We got, <laughs> this viral thing is, 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 is gonna be a short thing. There's going to be more viruses in the future and stuff, right? The real big picture is that what are we going to do to, to slow down the neurodegenerative changes and how do we support our immune systems? Wrap it up. Okay, Cynthia is telling me to wrap it up. Um, all right, listen, we're going to do this again. If you guys have any interest or you have any future questions uh, that I didn't hit on today, uh, text us, email us. We'll get right back to you with answers. We're here for you. Um, if you need me to do another presentation, if new information is coming about, and it will, and I feel it's relevant, and I think I can share some light on that for you guys, uh, I'll be happy to do this again. Um, I enjoy this, you know, I like talking with everybody. <laughs> um, so, okay. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.